Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator Amude yeah. uh, she's my sister from another mother she's from <laughs> Jordan she, she, she had a dental degree from the uh, University of Jordan in 2014 after which she completed a one year internship at the University of Jordan Hospital and obtained a Jordanian uh, dental license, after which she joined the private practice at the Jordanian French Dental Center in Amman, in Jordan. In 2016, she started teaching as a, a, a position as a teaching assistant in the restorative department of the dental faculty at the University of Jordan. Dr. Hamoude joined the post program at the University of Michigan in 2017, and she has just uh, uh, left, and she's now currently an assistant, clinical assistant professor at the University uh, Ohio State University. Welcome, Dr. Amude. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you all for being here today with us. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, present for you a, an interesting topic, I hope so. And uh, we're going to be discussing uh, fixed implant supported prosthesis. So, this is a big topic, but uh, I hope that we can today uh, touch on an important point in the planning um, uh, procedure. So, so will you, the can come to you in three types or three categories. Um, some of them will come to your clinic, walk in as indentulous patients in one arch or both arches. They can come to you uh, in their terminal dentate uh, status. And terminal dentition is given to patients where their current dentition is no longer deemed to be restorable or effective for long-term treatment plans. Or they may walk in your clinic having all the prosthesis that need replacements or sometimes repair. And the third category can be more complex because you don't have control over the implant positions already. And uh, mostly what we will be discussing in this lecture help you to be part of a team because obviously those rehabilitation treatments needs a team of uh, prosthodontics, surg surgeons, or uh, periodontics. And so let's go ahead and talk about what is the most important diagnostic is that you need to consider in your planning. And to start with, my list, let's, uh, the first of all is the facial profile and lip support. Those kind of rehabilitation treatment should be facially generated uh, treatment, which means that you need to take in consideration the patient profile and the uh, lip support. So on the uh, left side, we see a patient with insufficient lip support. And you need to consider this fact before you start planning any fixed prosthesis. Because first of all, you need to determine if your patient is a candidate for a fixed prosthesis. And why I'm insisting on this? Because the fixed prosthesis over implant should be flangeless, which means that for hygiene purposes and for the survival of your implants without any biological complication, we do not accept any flange in a fixed prosthesis. And such a patient for aesthetic to give him the support pack for his lab, we need some kind of restoring the missing soft tissue and the ridge by a flange. So we need really to take a look at that. Sometimes the patient doesn't have severe loss in his ridge or soft tissue and his left support or the angle. If you look at the nose to the upper lip angle on the right side, it's almost 90 degree or less. And look on the left side on the angle, which is obtuse between the nose and the, uh, the upper lip. So in this patient, maybe the lip support is not that issue but because of the jaw relation on, or the skeletal relation, being as a class three patient, you have to decide 
where you want to put your future teeth, how much you want to compensate for, for example, the uh, reversed overjet. And then when you have uh, visualizing the position of the teeth, the future teeth, related to the where is the ridge right now, you may end up with a huge uh, horizontal anterior cantilever that may make your uh, prosthesis under severe forces and question their long-term uh, success. Look for this, another patient that has a skeletal class three relationship. The first important thing is when you want to uh, judge the patient uh, jaw relations or uh, a skeletal relation, to judge that on an estimate vertical dimension. So, for example, his dentulus or uh, just keeping two teeth in the upper arch. Before starting anything, I need to take him uh, a jaw relation. Look at the upper right picture, and you can see that he has no vertical stops at all. So you need to decide a, a, a close estimate for the vertical dimension at which you will be restoring this patient, articulate them together, and then look with me at the lower pictures. This is what I mean by if you want to compensate for the reverse overjet, and sometimes we are limited by how we can do that. Like in this patient, for example, edge to edge is like pushing the extreme or pushing the limits. So look at the position of the future teeth regarding the original position of the ridge. That will put a huge anterior cantilever forces on your implants. So maybe those patients are more uh, candidates for removable overdenture rather than, for example, fixed prosthesis. So this is uh, for the first point. Now the second uh, diagnostic T that we have uh, to take uh, in consideration very carefully is the adequate restorative space. We need to know before we start uh, the treatment if the patient has enough restorative uh, place for this prosthesis. And this is sensitive to the selected material that we chose to restore the patient with. We will discuss that later in this um, uh, presentation, the types of the materials that is available nowadays for such a treatment. But generally, there will say that for metal resin prosthesis, uh, which is known as a wraparound or acrylic or the hybrid prosthesis, you need a minimum of 15 millimeter uh, length. And that length is measured from your future implant platform to the occlusal table. And for metal ceramic, we have at least eight millimeter. And for the cornea prosthesis, we need at least 12 millimeter of that uh, vertical uh, space. And that's, of course, because each material has different mechanical characteristics and the strength. And for metal resin restorations, they gain their strength from the bulk. So they are the most bulky restorations. Uh, look at this patient, for example. He needs a full arch uh, implant prosthesis or rehabilitation in the maxillary arch, and he's in terminal dentition. Um, so we started at the uh, average, let's say, or close vertical dimension. We took the bite and we articulate his uh, jaws together, and then we measured the uh, the 15 millimeter space, or for example, the 12 millimeter that we need for our uh, prosthesis whether we decided to go with zirconia or acrylic wraparound. And this decision has to be made by uh, considering many factors. We will discuss again that later. Uh, but for example, if you come and look and you don't have the 15 millimeter or you don't have the 12 millimeter between the proposed um, implant, like uh, from the edential uh, flange to the um, and proposed incisal edge in the future, then this patient, before considering an implant placement, we need to do for him some bone reduction. And this is the X-ray for like a, pan a panoramic X-ray for the patient. Sometimes when we uh, plan the reduction of the bone and we see at where is our new um, implant platform will be, like if we did a reduction of four millimeters, three millimeter in the anterior area to gain more space for the restoration, we end up not having enough, for example, length for the prosthesis. In this case, he was lucky and he has plenty of bone. 
height-wise and uh, also in a few dimensions. And so in cases where we, do, we, we are uh, Jupiter, like compromising the length of our implants, maybe we can uh, take a combination of adjusting our vertical dimension to open the bite a little bit with some uh, bone reduction as well. And that can be specific to each patient. So for this patient, we did mock surgery on the cast. Before doing anything on the patient, we have the opportunity now to make everything in the lab, first of all. And that helped us also to fabricate uh, an immediate denture for him after the surgery. And this is a very important diagnostic tool because now you have a, a, an actual and live uh, diagnostic tool that can help you imagining uh, the teeth position and uh, you can measure uh, actually the restorative space. Another important uh, key factor is the transition line. And what I mean by the transition line is where your prosthesis begin and the soft tissue ends. So this transition line has to be hidden when the patient smiles. Otherwise, we have an aesthetic problem because it will look fake. You don't want to walk around and let everyone when you smile know that you have a hybrid prosthesis or a fixed implant prosthesis. So this line has to be hidden. So to know uh, for that uh, to be uh, successfully done, we need to evaluate the patient's smile. Some patients that has very high lip line while smiling, they are at most more risk than other people with low smile line. And to help us diagnose the patient in a more systematic way, we have a classification done by um, Mitrani and his colleague in 2017. They developed uh, a lab and soft tissue classification, and we have four categories in this classification. Class one, when the patient has no defect, no soft tissue or hard tissue defect. And those patients, mostly the ones that are still in their terminal dentition, so the teeth are still there and need to be extracted, or patients with recent extraction, so there is no much resorption happening. And the class two patients where we have a vertical defect, means the resorption happened vertically, or there are recession on the teeth before they got extraction, so the roots are exposed. So those two categories, class one and two, they are at aesthetic risk. Why? Because when they smile, there is a bigger chance that they are showing their gums or their ridge, residual ridge. And that means if I put my implants platform at the current height of the ridge, then I have a risk that when the patient smiles, he will show the transition line. And that's what we don't want to happen because going back is not easy once the implants in. So that's why you have to be in the team restoring such patients with your surgeon and periodontics before even uh, going ahead uh, with the implant placement. Then we have a class 3 and class 4 where we have a horizontal defect but more severe and a combined defect between vertical and horizontal. And if you see in those two in the pictures, we need now flanges to support the lip and to compensate for the uh, the, the severe layers of ridges. So those categories, those the ones that we talked about that maybe they are not a good candidate for fixed prosthesis and they need another uh, treatment modality. So let's see the class one again. We said that this is falls be, below the um, aesthetic risk patients because they have minimal soft tissue loss or uh, prosthesis and with our prosthesis we don't want uh, we don't want that to show now one approach for this kind of patients is to do a reduction after the extraction in the ridge so we lower the height of the ridge so when the patient smile he hide the transition line or another modality is what we see in the pictures here is to give him a prosthesis with more number of implants but without a gingival a gingival part without restoring a soft tissue. Now, what is the problem with such uh, a, with such prosthesis is it's um, challenging. It is very challenging to get scalloping of the, of the soft tissue of an edentulous range to go between your teeth. 
And if we were successful to do that by a lot of provisionalizing over the implants, making temporary prosthesis to shape, try to shape the gum, is the maintenance of this scalloping and not ending up with a lot of black triangles. So this kind of a treatment is more challenging. Now, talking about the class two uh, category, as we said before, they have vertical defect. So they, they, could have, they could be at low risk or high risk of aesthetic uh, outcome. Depends on the smile line. Depends on the lip dynamics when they smile. So you really, when the patient walking in your uh, chair, the moment that you start talking to your patient, the moment that the patient starts to talk about himself, you start your evaluation because this is the best time when you see the natural dynamics of the soft tissue rather than requesting the patient to smile suddenly or on the moment. So this requires pink prosthetic material most of the time. And as we said, we, uh, we uh, judge according to the smile and the lip movement if we need it, for example, bone reduction, or if we are at good level to plan our implants. So you need to judge if you need further reduction in the bone ridge is to consider the restorative space and also the lip and smile line. And here, as we said, the class three and four, which are more uh, candidate patients for removable prosthesis because those kind of patients need support for their face and their lips. So they, they need flanges. And if we are saying flanges, then we definitely went to the other route, which is removable. And that can be over attachments or uh, like locators or with bars. So once we figured out if the patient needs uh, pre-prosthetic surgeries or if the patient needs preparatory phase, we come, of course, to the more detailed diagnosis by requesting more uh, x-rays and the 3D uh, images like CVCT to uh, judge or to see if we have an adequate volume in an adequate uh, position and to decide all, uh, over the number of implants that is needed. So a lot of patients walk in, if you look at this x-ray, look at the maxilla, for example. There is no bone height at all that we can place the implants on. So such a patient might need extensive surgery or major surgery by grafting, or that the patient just go to the other route, which is removable by a complete denture. Or some patients walk in with plenty of bone that may be uh, compromising your restorative space. And sometimes we need the pre-prosthetic surgery to create room for our prosthesis. If you look at the mandible, you see like a plenty of bone. And then other patients, they kind of in between, but they have irregular bone. And most of these patients, the patients that walk in in your clinic with recent extractions without alveoplasty. So that's why it's very important for patients in their terminal dentitions or whatever, wherever they uh, receive an extraction procedure is to look at the bone quality after uh, doing the extraction and try to level the bone and giving it a smooth configuration. I put these uh, pictures to show you that sometimes in the panorex X-ray you see a very good height of bone for uh, the mandible, for example, or the maxilla. But you have always to do your clinical judgment by if, uh, checking the width of the ridge and also by requesting the 3D images like CBCT. Because in this patient, you can see very clear that the, the, the crest of the ridge was very thin. We have like four millimeter of a thin crest sharp edge ridge, which is, of course, not adequate for any implant platform. So this patient needs to be prepared and needs a pre-prosthetic surgery. And in this patient, when I uh, did the alveoplasty, we found the remaining root that we extracted. You can see it on the lower left corner. So then comes to the question, if you have adequate bone, good bone that you can uh, place an implant for, do you go for all on four, all on six, or all on eight? How you 
uh, determine how many implants you want? This is an important question. And it comes to the, first of all, can we place this number of implants? Do we have a decrease one for eight or six or four? Then after that, is the patient can afford the cost, for example, for eight or six or four implants? This is another thing to consider. And the third more important thing from and from us, like as uh, as like from scientific point of view, are these restoration have the same the same long term success rate? So to answer some of these questions, we need to gather data from the literature to know how those prostheses uh, served on the long term. We have uh, the group uh, of the ITI community for implants and they made like they reviewed the literature and this uh, type of work was based on questions for example you need to uh, there's a question like how many implants i need so they go and they uh, summarize the literature do a systematic reviews and try to give the answer so regarding the success rate of the fixed arch prosthesis over how many implants they found that there was no statistically significant difference in implant survival rates associated with the use of fewer than five implants or if you use more than five implants and they included in their search nine randomized controlled trials and uh, 40 prospective and retrospective reviews and the, the, the follow-up was uh, medium term like eight years and there's a range from like some articles had the follow up of one year over 15 years, which means that if the designing, the treatment planning, everything is correct, four implants all on four will serve fair enough as all on eight or all on six. So it's again, it's and the treatment has to be customized to your patient needs. And talking about the number of implants, immediately click in our minds the cantilevers. Because we we know very well that on for for example or even on six prosthesis you have to cantilever uh, the molar area on the back because this is most of the areas that mostly you don't have enough bone to place implant there so our implants are more in anterior region and to compensate for second premolar or first premolar and first molar you need to cantilever that portion this is uh, mostly the case in patients and we have to consider the biomechanics and the applied uh, engineering solution to this biological problem not to end up with failure of implants talking about cantilever means that we need to consider the ap spread the anterior posterior spread of our implants this anterior uh, posterior spread you hear about it all the time and it's just the distance from a line as you see in the picture drawn from the most anterior uh, implant to the distal edges of the most posterior implants. Why this distance is very important? Because it can compensate for the cantilever length on the back. Look at those two situations, for example. You see on the left side a uh, horizontal linear alignment of the implants. Although we have six implants, but their aligning or their position really doesn't help. So it's not about the number of implants rather than the design and the distribution of forces. Look at the other side, for example, on the right side, we have better anterior-posterior spread of the implants. We need to distribute them on the curved arch as much as the bone and the anatomy allowed us to go because this will allow us to put longer cantilever on the back. And by longer, I mean that there are restrictions still. So many uh, authors try to define what is the ratio between the cantilever portion in the back to the anterior posterior spread of the implants? So, if you want to follow, to follow Rangard or Rangard, uh, I hope that I spelled it correct. Then the cantilever extension, according to him, uh, can be up to two times the AP spread. Takayama said no; it should not go more than two times the AP spread. It should be less than two times. And for English, he defined it that the cantilever extension should be at most 1.5 uh, times the, the anterior posterior spread. And the number or the exact number is not really 
important if we un if you understand the mechanics and the biomechanics of your prosthesis. One of the literature tried to define that in terms of length. For example, uh, they have uh, in this uh, work done by Shackleton and Shackleton and his colleagues. They have two groups where the cantilever were up to 15 millimeter length and the other group was more uh, than 15 millimeter length. And they found, considering the surviving rate, that the group with less than 15 millimeter length served better. So the rule is to try to minimize your cantilever length as much as possible. For example, the patient when he smiles, the corridors of his mouth doesn't show beyond the first molar, so maybe you can apply the shortened dental arch, meaning restoring, for example, a first premolar, second premolar, and one molar, or sometimes you can just choose one tooth from each, depends on the patient, depends on the AP spread, and depends on the available bone, and also taking into consideration the opposing arch, because natural dentition, the opposing arch, will put more forces than, for example, if the opposing arch was the same kind of prosthesis or denture or over denture or whatever. So the rule is to try to minimize the cantilever as much as possible and to control the occlusion and the occlusal points on those cantilever sections and very good distribution all over like the teeth and both sides. Look at this uh, picture, for example. This patient came to me in the consultations appointments during the uh, graduate school. And he got this prosthesis one year ago, or it was like one year and a half, and he complains from pain in the lower left region. So this is one piece prosthesis. And can you imagine how many implants are underneath? When I took the x-ray, I was completely shocked to see that three to four implants supported this very long span of a prosthesis. Although the opposing is complete denture, but it's still you are abusing the concepts. You are abusing the design concepts of the cantilever and the anterior posterior spread. Taking into consideration that the cantilever is not only posterior in the posterior segments, but can be also in the anterior segments. So right now, one of his implants already has lost its osteointegration, integration and he needs a treatment again. And he was shocked to know that, okay, I just got these teeth like one year ago. And I'm not ready to, to uh, spend more expenses into repeating these. So this is why we need to be really careful when we plan uh, uh, our patient treatments. So after considering all these diagnostic keys and the planning, it comes to be for some of the patient's factors. Is the patient, for example, in a good physical uh, shape with good manual dexterity? Uh, and compliance to clean and keep the prosthesis in a good shape because the maintenance matter. It doesn't matter if you did everything correct and you placed the prosthesis and you're happy with it and the patient cannot clean it because of less manual dexterity or because of the design problems. So the new, sometimes the overdenture is more... Um, wise to give for those kind of patients that cannot clean because they can take it out and they can clean it and have more control over it. Otherwise, it's a killing step to give them a fixed prosthesis and they cannot clean it. And another thing is to consider is the cost, obviously, because fixed prosthesis requires more implant than removable sometimes and also depends on the material you choose. So those are other factors that play a role in your treatment planning. All these points that we talked about, you can mm, nearly judge or uh, study from the first visit, from the first five minutes patient walk-in. A lot of the aesthetic points you have to uh, notice in your patient from the moment he starts to speak, and some needs more diagnostic tests and more study in the lab, for more details uh, intake. Now, if we look at what are the available materials or what happened to those uh, fixed prosthesis or how they started, 
Of course, they started with the uh, inter uh, introduction of implants to dentistry by Brennemark in the early 50s. And this is the point when all the complete dentures or where the removable dentures can be now fixed and flangeless. And the original design of this prosthesis was to have a gold alloy framework attached to the implants and then an acrylic resin and denture teeth around them. Uh, so this is the original design or how the fixed uh, implant prosthesis started. And it started as a metal framework, as we said, like the gold, where it can be the bulk and with very uh, or thinner uh, resin around or the wraparound design where we have more bulk on the resin uh, surrounding this uh, metal framework because as we said, the resin gains strength from bulk. And then we start to see more complications after applying this to the clinics or the clinical work. Because as we said earlier, most of the time the patient has more adequate bone volume to place implants in the front region uh, and not in the molar area. And we started to see problems in the materials like fracturing. And that's why we have more development in the material science in another material selection or if you look at the height of this wraparound material i i barely can see 15 millimeter for example for this one and also the cantilever link uh, to the anterior posterior separate of this uh, material so we start to learn more about the material and a lot of changing in the treatment concepts has developed so we all nowadays hear about all of our concepts and how it is was adopted or changed a lot by the uh, Malo clinic and it's said to have accumulative survival rates very high survival rates over the 90 to 100 percent actually and when you read just such papers you have to look carefully at the survival rates or success rates and to see the section of complications so this is just um, a very high number but that doesn't mean that the processes didn't have problems so but some of them if they are manageable then it's a valid treatment option and also considering that we applied the correct design concepts without abusing it as we saw before uh, in the x-rays so the idea is to increase the AP spread and use longer implants to increase bone anchorage. Then we have seen or more um, development in the technology and the CAT CAM workflow allow us to use zirconia material. And we just follow three magic steps, scan, design, and mill. Material wise, as we so already we started with metal framework and resin or you can have a pfm restoration portion infused to metal so you have a, a, a framework from metal and you can just cement over them individually crowns or it can be a metal uh, as we as we see on the right side or zirconia and zirconia can come in three designs different design either for full monolithic zirconia, as we see on the, uh, I will show you later, full monolithic zirconia prosthesis, or it can be as a framework as we saw in the PFM earlier, and you can just cement over a porcelain crowns, or it can be full monolithic, then you do a cut back and you veneer the anterior area. And also, uh, you have to put in mind that each design has different types of complications. For example, whenever we, s we see the acrylic wraparounds or the veneering uh, zirconia, we expect the chipping problems just because that system will have a hybrid or uh, more than two materials that have different uh, characteristics, mechanical and expansion, and all of these. Then nowadays we have a very new material which is PEAK, the polyether ether ketone. This material is believed to have a very elastic, uh, is to be very elastic and mimicking the bone uh, elasticity. So it can uh, absorb uh, the, uh, the occlusal forces or the shocks and it 
it's a no. So in the literature, there are very few articles or they are increasing now. And um, this study by Malo in 2018, he used it for uh, uh, rehabilitation of more than 40, uh, 40 uh, full arthroprosthesis. And as a conclusion to his study to see how this served, it was a short term follow up, a year, I think, or a year, more than a year. And then they, uh, they noticed that the material um, has very high success rate, let's say, but again, on the short term. But some of the patients had some uh, complications, like, for example, breakage in the uh, resin over the peak framework. And they kind of repaired it by adjusting the bonding system. So I just put it in to show you that when materials develop newly, we don't, we don't assume that they will have the same behavior as the materials that we are using before. And to learn more about these processes, we need more documentation. And maybe some lab tests will help before we try them in the clinic also. But we're still watching and we need more information on this material performance. So... This is, I'm sharing with you a patient treatment from one of the patients that I treated during the graduate residency to show you just a treatment from A to Z. This patient now is a dentient in the upper arch and she's wearing uh, a complete denture. And uh, then we, uh, you can notice that she has a low smile line, even like sometimes she smiles more than that, but we didn't need uh, further uh, like surgeries. So we placed the implants and five months later, we started our work. We used her complete denture to convert it into a fixed, a provisional restoration. And we did that to gain the advantage of trying to shape the ridge to accept the future prosthesis and help her in the hygiene. So what we are seeing in our pictures right now is a conversion of her complete denture to become, as we see on the lower uh, segment, of this slide, how we eliminate the flanges, and now we have a, a provisional fixed restoration. Then, after shaping the gum a little bit, or uh, she was using uh, the provisional, like the fixed after, but it was not immediate load. We waited after the integration five months, then we started all the work. And here we see how we took the impressions, splinted, and then we verified our models. And now it comes um, that she told me she likes the position of the teeth, but some aesthetics needed adjustments. So in one approach that I followed, I just print, uh, scanned her uh, provisional denture and printed. And then on this printed uh, copy, I did cut back and I waxed it up to, uh, to add some aesthetic work. <coughs> and then I tried it in her mouth. And I noticed that I need some adjustments still. I made them and I articulated in the articulator and then start to digitize it so I can uh, design a t uh, a t also a provisional or prototype. And here's the designing steps using some of the software's reshape. So it's a copy from what she had, and we tested that copy already in her mouth. Then I have the uh, meld uh, prototypes, and by prototype, I mean any interim prosthesis or <coughs> provisional restoration that can show you or give you an idea about the results before going and fabricating the final prosthesis. So give you, it's a very valuable diagnostic tool before or you can do all the adjustments you need on the uh, on on the occlusion, for example, or give the patient uh, a live or a real uh, tool to uh, judge the aesthetics or to see if they like it or doesn't like it. And sometimes they call they go home with it, so they can try it for a week or couple before coming back and give you maybe some points or if they approve it, so you can just send it for being uh, copied into your zirconia prosthesis. What we are seeing now is the prosthesis in uh, full monolithic zirconia. And if you noticed before in this picture, look at the gum part. On the gum part, I had a cutback to give the uh, lab uh, room to 
veneer the gum part only. So this process is all, is all for monolithic zirconia with a veneered gum uh, porcelain. So this approach or the CAD CAM or the development of technology help us to make a customized design for our patients and that's the delivery. Now regarding occlusion on full archer prosthesis, there is no much um, evidence in the literature that support one uh, over the other uh, occlusal schemes. Here I use the uh, the canine guidance and anterior like uh, uh, protected occlusion, but there is, as I said, there is no evidence support that uh, support one scheme over the other. And here is the delivery with uh, a predictable outcome because we have tested all of these beforehand and the patient approved it. So saying that doesn't mean, as we said, you have to look at the success survival rates of implants and the prosthesis itself and to look on the complications. And as complications, we can have mechanical, biological, or aesthetic complications during the surgery or during all the workflow that we have seen. And it's a long journey for the patient. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, one of the implant surgery during, like can happen, is to lose one of the implants or the site of the bone was, was softer or actually in this uh, case of treatment, uh, sometimes you lose, don't lose the order while placing the implants. Especially if you have like double arch, and this is more surgical complication, is try to be systematic and organized because what happened is in one side start to bleed more than the others while preparing the osteotomy. And just to stop sometimes the socket blood is just when you place the implant, it will compress and will stop the bleeding. But we did that before, um, uh, before like uh, starting from one order. And what happened is that we forgot which one we placed the implant in and when when try to tap over an implant it was a whole messed up story so <laughs> short short note is just do not lose the order because you can forget when a lot of parts in the surgical table you can lose the order and you can forget things another example is this patient came in with an older prosthesis and <clears throat> it was loose on one side i tried to take it out and retrieve it to see what's the problem one of the screws was broken and before that, I was giving him some anesthetic shots, and you can see how I got pus coming out when I did the anesthesia. And <clears throat> this is the pan for that case. You can see the loss of the bone, even in the lower mandible, and the upper anterior two implants were floating in soft, soft granulated tissue. And as I said, we had a prosthetic screw that was broken. I'm very pretty sure that this complication didn't happen over a short term. Those were there. There was a problem for years that exaggerated because we didn't have a maintenance. So <clears throat> the point from this, and look at the design as well. We don't want a concave intaglia surface because these are very hard to clean. And you can see how the plaque or the cements or the debris are uh, accumulated on the intaglio surface. And this is a dramatic uh, complication because now what's next? The patient lost the bone, he can, we cannot add two implants again, and now this is again uh, an abuse of the concept of all on four because there was a problem in the designing and there was a problem in maintenance. And this is another example where the patients come in with uh, a history of a repeatedly broken acrylic part of his prosthesis. He has acrylic wraparound. And the problem with his uh, prosthesis is that this is the x-ray for his implants and the bar, that it was violating the rule of the restorative space. We already discussed that this type of material needs bulk to gain a strength. So in this case, we didn't have the 15 millimeter we talked about. It was barely uh, 13 millimeter or 12. And also the patient is very sensitive with his tongue and he was always requesting from his previous dentist to reduce the bulk, to reduce the bulk from the palate. So you can see around the implants, there is not enough thickness of the material. So 
now we uh, can treat him differently with different type of material, either BFM or zirconia. So his prosthesis was replaced. And then uh, we have this example. I showed you already the lower mandible before, where we have the one piece, very long span <coughs> prosthesis, and it was made from porcelain, but the opposing is denture. And those are just one year old prosthesis. And we already have this massive wear of the opposing denture. So always the opposing dentition has to be taken into consideration when you select your material. And also, as we said, the distribution of the implants and the design. And you can see on the lower X-ray how the integration is lost already in one of the implants. So this is another patient I treated in the graduate program. On the left side, you see the patient in her terminal dentition. This patient had a Jocelyn syndrome. And then you see the converted denture on the second picture. Then I noticed that I didn't want to use it for the final prosthesis because I don't like the aesthetics of it. And uh, some issues happened during the relining process. So I started all over in arranging new teeth and give her on the third picture. We see the prototype. She got it home. She and I asked her, please, if you talk pictures, just share them with me because this is the best uh, time when the patients smile around their friends and family and you can be more realistic about their smile. So she liked it and we did the adjustments of occlusion and on the right uh, on the fourth picture you see the four prosthesis M. So maybe we can discuss more details about more patients in maybe a second part of this lecture. For today I think uh, that's it and thank you for uh, attending today and I'm ready for questions. Hello, hello. Thank you so much, Hamuda. You know, these are the things that have made me um, seek. I, I told myself I need to do something, uh, you know, more than what it, you know, what I what, what I learned in, in school. You have to like improve yourself, and some of the, some of the challenges that I um, that these cases present uh, has forced me to seek for more information and training. Um, mm -hmm. Doctor Gardia, are you are you are you there? Yes, yes, I am. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just dragged you in. You know, what? What's, do you have any comments? I know we are, we are, we are bringing you forth um, very soon. Um, you said you're going to be speaking on immediate loading? Yes. Yes, I'll be speaking on immediate loading. So um, there's going to be some overlap of uh, the, the material that was, that was shared today. But uh, it was a, she, she covered really good points. Um, uh, throughout the presentation, very thorough. All righty. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, I, I hope that we can have, you know, four or five sessions about on, on all, you know, because I, I think it's, it, this is the treatment of the future. You know, I, I, I guess we are affected by, we are affected by, by marketing. <laughs> I, yes. I've seen Claire Choice on TV several times and I said, you know, I want to be able to do that. You know, I want to be able even if to do the restorative portion of things. You know, so what? How do you think one one can move from uh, just um, removable to fixed in terms of uh, for general practitioners who are listening to us who want to be able to do that? What 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 what's the cost effective way of doing this? Well, there are a lot of things to consider. Uh, maintenance is number one. Uh, you saw in this presentation how uh, the lack of maintenance and the, and the and the lack of planning can be destructive and can take you right back to uh, where you started, back to removable if it, if things are not uh, well planned and well explained to the patient that they need to come back frequently. I I tell patients it's like buying a car because many times they say, "Oh, this costs as much as a car," and I say to them, "Well, just just like you would buy a car and you would need to go back for regular maintenance." This is the same thing. Putting a lot of mechanical parts in your mouth, you need to return for regular maintenance because uh, people start to think, well, I, since I don't have teeth anymore, I don't need to come back. So uh, that's one thing. But in transitioning from a, from a complete denture to, to this sort of uh, treatment, uh, you have to also uh, understand the risks and benefits of uh, dental implants. So if you're dentulating a patient, you're taking away their natural teeth and you're 
placing this in, these implants in, um, you, you have to maintain those implants as well. Um, I, I, you know, if, if we're, if you're saying being able to do, do a denture and do a full arch uh, on implants, you know, what is the easy way to tell a general dentist to transition? I, I cannot tell an easy way to transition. Um, just like you said, this is a matter of training and to, you know, many companies out there will have, uh, guides. They'll say, oh, we can help you, you know, create the, like a Chrome guide or, uh, in sequence, it'll be easy. Sometimes people, uh, have labs that come in and do the, do the transition for the, the conversion for them. Okay. And yes, there are a lot of tools to help you get to the fixed arch, but getting to the fixed arch and putting everything in is only the beginning of the race. That's the starting line. You know, maintaining this is a marathon. So that's the thing that I would, I would, uh, urge doctors to, to realize that getting them to a fixed point, to a fixed place is the starting point of the race. Now, whenever there's any complication, uh, chipping of, uh, veneered materials or, uh, implant loss, uh, you have a smoker, you have patients that you didn't consider the risk factors, you know, whether they're biologic risk, risk factors or other, um, there's a long-term maintenance and there's no easy way and it costs money uh fractured screws that can be a nightmare as well uh whether you know that's why i like to use abutments you know some people do direct to implants if you fracture a screw in an implant versus fracturing a screw in an abutment there's a big difference uh and the way you can sleep at night so i can't say there's an easy transition from a denture to full arch fix i'm, I'm sorry i wish i could but there isn't all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Abrashi, are you still there? Dr. Yes, Abrashi. I am. All right. I, I know that I, I know you guys do these things on a daily basis. Uh, you know, I, I, most people who are, want, to, want to be able to, you know, improve their skills. What comments do you have? Uh, firstly, great comments from uh, Gardier. Um, I've known Gardier for almost 18 years. He was a student of mine at U of M. Wow. Um, and also for our speaker today, Dr. Hanin, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, the transition from being either partially edentulous or fully edentulous to a fixed hybrid is complex. There are, there are um, uh, biological factors. There's obviously surgical factors. There's aesthetic factors. It's really a, a blending of many, many disciplines. It's not an easy thing. If you are a general dentist wanting to, to learn about this, what I would do is I would try and talk to a local prosthodontist who's got some experience and go to their office and see what they're doing. Um, if you have an oral surgeon close by or a periodontist who's experienced, I would also try and go see the surgery. There's a lot going on. And if you're trying to do the surgery yourself and the prosthetics, that's extremely challenging. That's almost impossible to do. I know about five dentists in the last 25 years that I've met who are, who are competent at both. Um, so in a nutshell, like Gardia said, it is not an easy thing. You have to understand removable prosthodontics very, very well before you transition to anything fixed. you got to un understand what a transition line is. You have to be able to understand phonetic implications, um, contour of the prostheses, um, Understand the psychology of the patient. If you go from a fully edentulous patient with a maxillary denture to a hybrid with a, with a horseshoe shaped palate is, is an easy transition. But to go from being fully dentate to something relatively bulky, that can be challenging because patients can be unhappy. So it's complicated. You need to, um, to keep learning. And I've done these for the last 10 years. I've done a couple of thousand of these and I still learn something new every single day. There's no such thing as a simple patient. They all bring a challenge. It may be psychological. It may be surgical. It may be medical. That each of these cases, treat them with respect and, and, and th th they will humble you, mm. as I've learned. All right. All right. Thank you so much. On the 17th of, of, of July, we're going to have Dr. Ebrashi back. He's going to be talking about all on four concept demographics, comorbidities, and treatments. Uh, so the, the flyers are going to be out this week. Make sure you, you take advantage of these 
is uh, and, and the videos uh, the, the the recordings are going to be on YouTube. Doctor Gadia is going to be on on uh, on the nineteenth of of July, uh, two days after that, talking about immediate loading. And also, we have uh, on tomorrow we have someone from uh, from Portugal. I, I think he works in the Malo Clinic. Uh, Doctor Jao Peter. He's going to be talking on raising bonded bridge. He was saying, you know. I know everybody wants to learn about implants, but um, sometimes you just want to do a fix, a reasonable fix option, um, rather than you know doing an implant in an aesthetic zone. We're, we're also going to have um, Dr. Uh, Mendoza Daniela. She's going to be talking about uh, can implant surface topography affect osteointegration? Yeah, certain basics that we need to have about implants. I know everybody wants to go place an implant, but you need to understand, you know, some just the fundamental science. And we want to, you know, start going back into all, all that. And um, hopefully we're going to have a, a good time tomorrow. Thank you so much. Dr. Hanin, are you still there? Yeah. Um, you are, you're, 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 the, the, I think, I don't know if you overwhelmed us today, but uh, not very many questions, but a very, very detailed presentation. And for myself, looking at it, I'm like, um, you know, I have my own comments about your presentation. I'm like, okay, I need, you need to send me that, that, uh, <laughs> you, need, you need to send me the presentation because, I mean, there's so much um, uh, you have put in there in terms of literature review and everything. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And uh, looking forward to bringing you back to talk more. I know you've done so many cases um, in terms of even, you know, 3D printing and all, all the things you've done. Uh, hopefully, we can get you back. Uh, thank you. Very, I'll be happy to. All right. Let me see. Is there any any question out there? Let me see if there's any question in the chat. Uh, okay. So <laughs> someone says it was overwhelming. You know. Uh, you know. It's not. It's, it, it is. And, and this is what yeah. you overwhelming is what people do on a, on a daily basis. So it's like training. I mean, she has spent you know over three years trying to learn this stuff. So you know, I, I think yeah, training is important. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge topic. You can talk about it like hours, but I try to put like important key points. Yeah. Yep. All right. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, well, I'll see you guys tomorrow. This video is going to be available on YouTube. Uh, do subscribe to the channel, share with your friends, and see you later. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 